Shamangelic Healing Podcast is designed as a platform to share authentic conversations about real life issues, providing you with valuable resources and tools to support you in shining your most authentic self, creating a thriving life that you absolutely love, and to support you in manifesting your soul's mission. Welcome to the premiere episode of the Shamangelic Healing Podcast with your hostess, Anahata Ananda. We have a special treat for you today as we took the podcast on the road to Austin, Texas, where we're filming our first interview at the headquarters of On It, which is Aubrey Marcus's company, and he's our first guest. And if you don't know Aubrey Marcus, he is the best-selling author of Own the Day. I love this book. There's phenomenal tips about one day at a time of how to take your life to the next level. Um, so check that out if you haven't. Aubrey is also the host of the Aubrey Marcus podcast, which is a world-renowned podcast. I'm actually a, been a guest on that a number of times, so definitely check that podcast out. And he is a fanatic about human optimization, so he and I really dive into all kinds of different topics on his podcast and also this one for ours. So today we're going to explore self-esteem, what inhibits and blocks self-esteem, and also what enha en enhances and strengthens it. I know you're going to love this podcast, so let's check it out. All right, so honored, so excited. Welcome to another episode of the Shamangelic Healing Podcast. And a special treat for you today because I'm in the house in Austin, Texas. The podcast has gone on the road and we are the guest of Aubrey Marcus, my brother. We're here at On It and so grateful to dive in today to self-esteem and how authentic power is so different than uh, force and um, how to tap that. So thank you so much, Aubrey. Welcome and um, thanks for having me here and hosting me here um, where we've done podcasts here late, lots of times. We have. And thanks for coming and providing your medicine and magic for everybody here in our little hometown and uh, all the breath work you're doing at Black Swan and helping, uh, helping all the fam out. So yeah. great to have you here. Yeah. We have been, uh, for those of you that don't know, Aubrey, uh, long time brother, uh, nine years I think we counted, mm -hmm. um, and, and counting. And um, we first met in Sedona at a retreat. And it was a big time of transformation for you. And what hasn't been a big time of transit? <laughs> right. When is it going to stop? It's right? been about nine years. It keeps growing. You, know, you, you, you always think it's a big time, and then the bigger time yeah. comes, like, this was the one. Right. And then it's another time, like, whoa. Right. I wasn't, I was hard that to was, do that was, that was easy. That was the that easy That was the work. first step. That was the light quantum leap. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and th this one is, it, you know, I've, I've had the blessing of watching you um, over these last nine years. And this was pre on it. Mm -hmm. And a big part of what you were stepping into in your identity you know, was, was coalescing at that time. And so what I want to dive into is about self-esteem and what gets in the way of that and what has driven really your success in a healthy way and where are some places that maybe haven't been so healthy? Well, most of the places, most of the drives that we all have are not coming from a healthy place. They're either coming from some desire to prove something for some external reason that you think is going to make you feel good. And then there's some lust and some craving and some other stuff that's kind of just the normal parts of the human condition. Like, oh yeah, it would be dope if I could have the money to go to Thailand. Or like, wow, I would love to take this pretty girl on this date. And, and that's like, that's kind of like pretty par for the course. Yeah. That's just some human stuff. But where it gets a little bit heavier is when it's like, I need to be successful to show my dad that I didn't need to go to Goldman Sachs and that it's okay that I got a philosophy degree and that it's okay that I started a marketing company and I'm not a fucking bond derivatives trader, you know? Like that stuff gets a little hard because you've internalized these programs that you've gotten from your parents and gotten from the world and so it's not only proving it to your dad but it's proving it to the judge inside yourself that agrees with the things that your dad said and that's the cycle that unless you can break that, you'll always be subjected to some authority outside of yourself. And it's never achievable. It's an empty, hollow victory because 
it's likely you're not ever going to get father's approval or mother's love in the way in which is, you know, is deeply desired and wanted. And then it leads you constantly reaching, constantly accommodating, constantly seeking approval outside of self. And, and, and it's never enough because you can have the money, you can have the cars, you can have, you know, the relationship. And if it's always for someone else, then it's the highest level of achievement is never enough. And it's a, it's the hollow victory. Yeah, it is. And you know, an interesting thing is like, there is a lot of, I think, blame that goes on childhood and parents and things like that. And certainly I had, you know, plenty of stuff with my dad and stepdad and there was some stuff, but <clears throat> on the mother side of things, I mean, I really got blessed. Like, yeah. I'm like, I'm you like, did. I'm like yeah, maxing out the score. You know, people are asking, people ask my mom, they say, aren't you so proud of your son because of all of the things I've accomplished? And she looks at him with a quit, like a puzzled look on her face and goes, what do you mean? I've been proud of him since he was born. Right. It's and not she negotiable. means that. Yeah. It's like there's no conditional amount of love that she's giving me more now that I'm Aubrey Marcus, CEO of our right. New York Times, best of right. all this. She doesn't give a shit. Right. You know, it's like she's loved me the same ever since. So I've actually had that, which right. is a very unique and rare, rare situation. And I've still been totally fucked up. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> like, it's not like that's the panacea. Like, everybody right. thought I would have just had, you know, love. the love. You yeah. know, like, it has helped me in a lot of ways, no yeah. doubt. And it's shown me you know, maybe a roadmap and who knows what it would have been without it. But it's not like there's just certain parts of being in this existence and in this world, despite your parents and despite what happened, you know, you're going to have some work. There's just no escaping it. And that's finding self. I I think that regardless of someone's love or support or the absence of it, you still have to find your own rhythm and what is going to make you proud about the, the choices and the actions that you're making for yourself. Mm-hmm. And are you being the, the kind of man you want to be? Or are you kind of the kind of woman that you want to be? And are your actions really for you? And that's where self-esteem is authentically driven versus um, for somebody else. So t- uh, tell me a little bit about what, dr- what it was about trying to get your dad's approval that, that really hurt or challenged or messed with you or... Well, you know, my father was always, he was very financially successful, but most Mm. of his financial success actually happened when I was, you know, really young Mm -hmm. in the early eighties, um, was when he really had his breakout in the late seventies. Uh, so I wasn't there necessarily for his prime, so Mm -hmm. to speak, but he was always, he was always in an extremely powerful position because he, you know. He was one of the market wizards. There's a book by Jack Schwager that talks about him, you know, one of the early uh, leaders and pioneers in commodities and futures trading. Um, so there was always like a very high bar that was set. Mm. And he was someone who had did his best to learn about love and capital L love and did his best to do the work, but had a lot of very conditional patterns where, you know, if I played good in a basketball game, then he was happy. If I didn't, he was sad and sometimes very critical and like very sometimes angry and sometimes so, and if I got good grades, again, happy. If I got bad grades, sad, you know, upset. If I did good, it was always this really highly conditional pattern, mm-hmm. you know, and um, so you just get kind of used to that and you get used to never feeling like you're worthy of love unless you're really killing it. You know, unless you got A plus, unless I scored 30, unless I, you know, did all the things, then I wasn't getting my dad's love, what felt like my dad's love, because it was his attention, his happiness, his, you know, enthusiasm. Um, And so I internalized that. And so I internalized that by not giving myself the love that, unless I was performing. And that was kind of the pattern that I carried with me for a long time. Right? It's heavy. We don't even realize that it's happening is is that, oh, this is what success means is that he's got to be proud of me. And the thing is, is that even with straight A's or even with basketball, you know, championship or this or that, it's, it's still not ever enough sometimes with someone like that, whose bar is set so high that it's unachievable. Mm -hmm. And, or there's always a next level. Oh, well you got to, you got to the championships, but this, but that. And even when you get it, it's so dissatisfying because then what are you working towards? Because you tilt yourself, <laughs> you tilt yourself towards these goals, 
and then you think that when you reach that goal, everything's it's good. Well, good. maybe you do get a little hit. You get that little dopamine love hit, you know, like, oh yeah, I actually did it. But then you've oriented your entire self towards working towards doing something so that you could love yourself and then you do that thing and then what else do you do? Well, you got to look for the next thing, but if the next thing is just the same thing, just because, bigger or, or bigger, yeah. I guess, but yeah. sometimes it's not like yeah. it just gets silly. Like if your goal is like one day I'm going to be driving down the street and I'm going to have a nice car and you get that nice car and you've been working your whole life for that. What are you going to do? Get two nice cars, <laughs> right? three nice cars, right. seven nice cars. Like what is that really? It's super diminishing returns. Right. And so you start to figure that out. Like all of these things that you're chasing, they have a steep you know, hedonic tolerance, a steep pleasure curve downward right. until you start focusing on the inward stuff. Right. And you and I both know people that are billionaires or that have lots of cars in the garage or have achieved professional success or financial success and are absolutely miserable. Most of them. Most of them. <laughs> you know, and, and so this is, how, how, how did you turn that around? How did you individuate from your dad and how did you figure that out that says wow I'm stuck in this pattern of achievement and you know we, we can all do that whether it's I, I want to achieve social media status I want to achieve a best-selling author status I want to achieve financial status I want I want a lot of attention from the opposite sex or the same sex I want to feel loved and worthy and there's so many different ways in which we can be addicted to seeking that mm -hmm. and where and how uh, you know what were the catalysts for you to kind of liberate yourself and and there may be some of that still in progress it's still in progress for of me yeah. you know um, and and what were the things that helped catalyze the liberation from that pattern well I think achieving achieving what I've always set out to achieve and realizing that it didn't solve all the problems <laughs> like, that's essential and that's that's actually a puzzle for me because not everybody's going to be able to achieve all the things that they've endeavored right. to achieve. Right. And so for the people who aren't able to learn that way, it is challenging because you have to listen and you have to be able to listen to a podcast like this from someone who has like, I've literally accomplished my dreams to date. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, there's magnitudes and there's, you know, turning the volume right. knob up, amplifications, whatever. But I've always wanted to write book. I've always wanted to start a company and a movement and get my get a message out there and, and I'm doing all those things. Phenomenally well in my dad. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so but then accomplishing that and realizing that it didn't give me that sense of wholeness right. that I was always seeking, that sense of peace. Um, that was one element. And then simultaneously doing that inner work to achieve states of like radical bliss mm -hmm. and release that were unconnected yeah. to these doings that I was doing. It was more about the being and that's everything from the plant medicine work to the shamanic breathing work that we've done to all of these different transcendent practices and transformational practices. That showed me like another side, like, hey, it didn't matter what I'm accomplishing, what I'm doing, whether my company's doing well or not doing well, like I can reach these states regardless. And it's because it's who I am and what I am inside and so it's the combination of having the worldly goals not satisfy and then having these transformational stillness, inner, you know, states of being truly satisfy that you just start to pay attention. And that's where the soul is nourished rather than by the achievement because this, the achievement is fleeting and it is conditional. Sometimes the status is this, sometimes it isn't. And money goes like this and money goes down. And right. you've ridden that roller coaster. I've ridden that roller coaster. And I'm sure many listening and watching have ridden that roller coaster where, okay, I achieved it. Oh, now, now it went away. You know, or I had this health and now I'm injured. Or I had this relationship and it was the best. And now I don't have that. And um, noticing how fleeting the roller coaster that those things that we acquire or, or achieve that it's also quite conditional not unlike human love at times <laughs> is that it comes and goes and mm -hmm. it's not all that predictable and uh, being able to ride that roller coaster and realize this isn't this isn't it and and or and if you're still in that loop of attaching worthiness then only when I win the championship do my fans love me and when I don't I get 
death threats <laughs> and right. you know you and I both know uh, professional athletes that that is re the really the case yep. and 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 where where hate mail and your own family won't even look at you if you didn't <laughs> achieve you know and I've done some work with the professional athletes that you know that you well Bodie Miller's talked about yep. that story right? right you know like he was on the cover of all the magazines he was the poster boy for the Torino Olympic Games and Bodhi has his own style, and his style is that he he is himself always before a race. When in the races he wins, he's like that, and the races he loses, like that. But there's a story, there's a narrative that the racer needs to be in bed early the night before the race, and needs to be on this very strict diet and whatever. People don't realize that some people, if they do that, if Bodhi tried to just force himself down to bed and not see anybody, he would have just turned himself into a. Right inside out in a mental turmoil yeah. he needed to get out around people and not think about racing that's part of his fucking practice yeah. so let the world champion be a fucking world champion but anyways <laughs> what happened all right so Bodie goes out and he's out drinking a beer and ha hanging with people and then the next day he crashes well guess what Bodie crashes half the fucking time right. he races anyway so he, that's how <laughs> that's it goes he either it. wins or it's crashes so, part of the so sport. everything is consistent yeah. everything is consistent with who he is, how he races, what he does. He goes as hard as he can. And sometimes he wins, sometimes he crashes. Well, this Olympic, he crashes. That's just going to be, you know, and later on in life, in some Olympics, he won. And I've seen him in, right, right. I've seen him walk to the mountain in Beaver Creek, really not paying attention the night before. <laughs> you know, at 5 a.m., he's like, damn, I got to race it. I got to be out of race in two hours. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do. And just win and just crush everybody. And everybody's like, who is at home playing fucking Yahtzee by right, themselves right, at 7 right, p.m. Right. is not. So anyways, he got so much hate mail and death threats after he didn't win that because people thought he didn't care and it was unpatriotic. He actually had a lower public opinion score than OJ after he was whoa, riding around in the whoa, fucking Bronco. Right. Oh right? my God. And it's like, that's the kind of stuff that's, that's really you know, really makes you realize how fickle public opinion is. And if you tether yourself to that, you're fucked. You're screwed, for sure. And if you tether yourself to a parent's approval, same thing. Same thing. Because they're, they're, what they think is best for you through their eyes may be so far from the truth, even if the intention is good. Hey, you should go be, you know, you should be, you know, get a scholarship in, in soccer, you should go be, you know, trading. You should mm -hmm. be commodities in, in New York. You should do this. You should do that. And it's often through what they didn't, uh, what they want for you or their unrealized dreams projected. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, or just, a, it's just an, an ego trip of them being able to tell their friends this, the comfortable story that's okay. approved by that. I really think that w there's just a, an overriding, terrifying fear that a parent has that, they're gonna to have to explain to their other peers. My, my son did kid, this. Yeah, he's my just daughter kind did of that. figuring it out, and then I'm like, mm. well, my son's a doctor. And he's an <laughs> orthopedic surgeon, and, you know, and like, and you're just worried about that one-upsmanship of your progeny, and it's so, it's so silly. But I see so many parents in that trap. Right, because that's the same thing when when a parent is determining their self-esteem based on their child's right. Um, uh, achievements or not and so gosh I, I guess I'm not a good mom or, or dad if my son's got an addiction or my daughter got pregnant or you know like mm -hmm. those kinds of things and so this is all around the solar plexus this is all around the unhealthy identities when we're reaching for approval from our children's behavior or our father's approval or fickle fans or Facebook likes or people buying your book or reviewing your book. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, around that solar plexus and identity, like really stepping into your own identity, uh, what was something that really helped you do that? I think you got to understand who you are. Yeah. Like, who are you? And that is a very complicated question, mm -hmm. but also a very simple question. It's like one of those things, it's many things and nothing at the same mm -hmm. time, right? Um, but first of all, I had to ex expand the understanding of who I was. So the first one was to stretch it all out and be like, okay, well, I'm a body. Yeah. I'm, I'm an animal. And that animal is a primate that has evolved with certain instincts, certain conditions, certain 
you know, ways in which it can grow and be healthy and thrive. And so understanding the animal element of myself. And then there's the mind element of myself, which is largely guided by social dynamics, mm -hmm. this kind of tribal structure that we grew in where being cast out from the tribe was a death sentence. Yeah. You know, you needed the support of your community. So how, that's why all these social dynamics are so interesting and important. We're so addicted to drama because drama back in the day might have been life or death. Right, right? but you're in or out if of the you're tribe. you're in or out of the tribe, you're not going to be able to survive alone. Humans needed to depend on each other for, for life, right. for fire, for right. food, for that's everything. Right. So we, the mind is kind of taking all of these things which are no longer life or death and making them life or death, <laughs> right. you know, and so all of these kind of patterns of fear and, and, the, and all of these things, so really understanding that and then understanding where's the watcher of this all, where's the consciousness that's behind this, where's the spirit or the soul or the thing that's transcending this life, transcends and, and moves past the body and the mind and exists beyond these things and is here right now, you know, the whole time with us, like, what is that thing? And I think as I've first separated those things and then now working towards the unification of those things in which there's the right hierarchy, you know, <laughs> where it's not the mind in control or the, the lustful body right. in control or the, or the emotional, hung, body. emotional, emotional right. body in right. control or like whatever, whatever is there, but that the consciousness is actually in the driver's seat and that everything is in right accord and that the mind can be appreciated and sent love and used to solve different situations mm -hmm. and analyze Plans things and sure. the body can be celebrated and nourished and just you know an open dialogue can be created so really I think it was about expanding it and then putting it in the right hierarchy and then ultimately I'm looking for that unification where there's just a sense of knowing that supersedes everything which is the symphony of all of these disparate elements of the self what I appreciate that, uh, you know, is that there is requiring us to step back outside of the self that is only seen by the other, by, is, that is only seen by a parent or that it, the, where we're constantly getting reflections, the mind is getting, con you know, reflections of who we are based on how somebody behaves, whether they include me, whether they don't like me because of this or that, um, and am I doing it right, do I fit in? And, and, and am I loved? Am I worthy? All of those conditions. And that's how the mind creates the construct of whether or not we fit in and whether or not we're loved and accepted. And what I appreciate about what you said is we've got to step out of the roles and the reflections to actually identify what is the higher version of self. Mm -hmm. The self that is not this gender, the self that is not this person's son or daughter, the self that is not this person's partner, Without the roles, without the identities, without the um, accolades or judgments of anybody else, that's the I am presence and like that, that's the solar plexus. The part of identity that isn't part of the collective community that is sovereign and is individual and is not meant to conform and it's not, it's not our best, that's not the best version of us to conform. Different from survival, where we, where we conform for survival, we're not in that place anymore where we have to conform to survive. Yeah. Um, however, we would love to cooperate a little better so we can mm -hmm. <laughs> survive. Um, that level of authenticity is where, where our, our power is, I think, really truly derived from because it's not conditional on any external, external reality or external influence. And it stays whether the... Whether wind is blowing, blowing this way or that way, whether fan approval is this way or that way, whether the bank account is up or down, whether I'm whatever my relationship status is and whatever my business is doing is that that's the part that stays. And, and when it's not linked to an external circumstance, that's the part of the soul that is the authentic power. And that's where we can be like, wow. I'm invincible from that place, mm -hmm. totally invincible. Like, oh, you can break up, you know, this can happen, that can happen, and I'm still okay. And I think that that's where the, the authentic power gets really juicy and exciting. It just doesn't matter if whatever happens, I'm okay. Yeah. Like really deeply. There's, a, there's some old stories that, you know, some of the shamans told of, you know, from back in the warrior times that 
there would be certain warriors whose third chakra, mm -hmm. that place of knowing who they were, was so strong that they were they were the elite of the elite. Right. Like their fearlessness right. in battle, because it wasn't dependent on how they were doing, how they were seen by other people. Their knowing of who they are, who they were in their place, and also that spiritual knowing, you know, connecting the crown. Right. It's like an interesting connection between that crown, like the, where the source comes in and where we are, hold ourselves, which is in, you know, the solar plexus, our identity. And, I, and I've been noticing that connection. And I think those stories talk about that as well, because that fearlessness has to come from also the divine knowing that there were something more than our identity self as well. And that connection, when that connection was strong, they were the most invincible warriors. Right. You know. That's where they, you know, that's where when the identity is humble, when the solar plexus is in alignment, it's humble enough to receive guidance, support, truth, courage, faith from a higher power. And mm -hmm. love and peace and inspiration and wisdom from a higher power. So that's exactly where the two chakras of the solar plexus, the third and the seventh, which is divine connection, is also connected to the sixth, which is how I see myself and how I see reality. And those three are so beautifully connected that that's where the divine inspiration comes in and has my back so that I'm not relying on something conditional to have my back. I've got actually something solid that loves me no matter what, that sees me no matter what, that also wants me to be victorious. And the humility... Of, of bowing our solar plexus down, not out of subservience, but out of wisdom that says, hey, sure, help a sister out, help a brother out. Hey, yeah. if you have power, wisdom, and insight that my teeny little brain cannot perceive of, you bet I'll receive that. And that this is where those, those the shamans, those elders, those chiefs, were and the seers the oracles in the tribe were gaining their power from yeah. it wasn't coming from this limited mind of being uh, afraid of being run over by a buffalo <laughs> mm. it was like wow i can i can access higher dimensions of wisdom and courage and strength that is beyond my personal limitation and right. I, I just feel like that's where authentic power comes in and just gets lit up with an exponential rate of expansion and it, and it's on uh, and it's unlimited and I just get so excited about drawing my strength and power from that place what uh one thing I'd like to get your wisdom on is I think my my understanding of that kind of third eye yeah. the sixth chakra mm -hmm. my understanding of that it almost feels like I've been and perhaps this is a balance this is a move towards balancing mm -hmm. where I've always been very third eye dominant like my vision trying to dream into what I'm trying to create huh. and like where that's going to go but now I, I'm really trying to move into a sense of knowing that contains an inherent spontaneity to it, yeah. with which, which is really breathing into an I don't know. Yeah. So I almost, I almost have a, a little bit of a negative perception of okay. my sixth chakra, of mm -hmm. this like, stop thinking, bro. Like, just stop <laughs> thinking, just trust. You don't have to figure it out. And that's probably, like I said, it's a balancing act. But maybe, maybe if you could you know, breathe into what the sixth chakra, that third eye, that mind sure. in a healthy ecosystem is doing and what its purpose is when it is empowered by heart and source and everything. Thank you for that question because it, it, because we're, you said mind, so the mind is not actually what's driving the sixth chakra. Yeah. So it's perspective. And sometimes, just like you were saying, hey, that's the witnesser. And it's also how we see things rather than saying this is this is happening for me rather than to me then that is a way of seeing it it's not just a matter of using our third eye for seeing and envisioning the future mm. because that is with intent i'm coming telling this is how the future is going to be so there's there's a value let's say like say we, we take with Bodie miller that's saying hey i'm going to visualize i'm going to use my brain to visualize the run, this, that, this right, or the fight, or the game, or whatever it is. And visualization, using visualization is actually using the quality of the mind to imagine, mm. which is not exactly the third eye. The third eye is about seeing the bigger picture and seeing through divine eyes and being that witnesser. And so the third eye is not necessarily limited to vision yeah. because we can see things, we can also hear things, like you said, 
knowing thing, that's clear cognizance, that's kind of knowing, and then there's clear sentience, which is feeling. That's all actually coming through the, the channel of the third eye, which is all perspective. And allowing, a, allowing the witnesser or the higher self or the divine or creator to infuse peace, calmness, this is this challenge is happening for me so that I can be stronger. This door is closing so another one would, would open. And so I, I, I really see that more as the Ajna as perspective yeah. that is beyond my human mind's capacity. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And it's really oh. important for me to look at it that way. Because <laughs> otherwise I'm like, I think because I, I've... I understand that the limitations of the mind are something sure. that, and that's really, that's, it's my prison builder. You know, yeah, that's the in, brain. A, in yeah, a lot yeah, of ways, yeah. my, my mind is, is the place where I build the prisons that I suffer in with the fake bars and the fake locks and the yeah. fake, and then I go, mind, what did you, what did you just do here? You right. built this thing? Oh, good job. Like right. it's a great prison, a great moat around the great prison. <laughs> the great, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Where you put well out, done. You put well done. Like, did good. Good job. <laughs> it's fear not things. real. Yeah. You know, and then I so walk out right. again and I'm like, so I think I have this kind of tension with that element, but to understand that that's not actually the third eye. The third eye is the perspective to, right. to laugh. Right. The, the third eye is the one that laughs at the mind that's building the prisons and is exactly. aware of it and it goes, ha ha, right. that was a good one. Right. <laughs> you know? And that, that the third eye, so the mind is all of the brain and right. all of its beliefs and structures and fears and programs, that's the mind. Within the, within the mind, within the brain, we're actually talking about the pituitary gland the, and and then above that, which is which is connected to the sixth chakra, and the pineal gland, which is also in the middle of the brain, um, which is connected to the seventh chakra. This is where we get in, we we are connected to the divine and higher consciousness, and this is how it filters through where we can perceive with a higher perspective what our human eyes are seeing. Mm. That like like you and I have been in Sedona before and. Uh, I've got a new mountain to show you. Yes. So, okay. So now I just uh, okay, just planting uh, <laughs> just planting that seed. Yeah. I've got a new new elder to to um, show you because that's the same that like in the shamanic path, we would look at a mountain and the human eyes or the mind sees mountain. But you and I, if we're accessing that ajna and that higher perspective, we see a grandfather. An elder, a wisdom keeper that's hundreds of millions of years old. And so that's using a different part of my mind, but really it's my third eye and not my human eyes that is seeing. Wow, I can sit at the feet of this grandfather and I can learn from this elder. Yeah. And so seeing it as something other than that, or bear, or crow, or snake, or, or this breakup, or this addiction... Or this, this lack of approval, oh, from my father is setting this bar? Well, let me see the bigger perspective of that. Oh, he's showing me what not to do. Mm. Oh, you know, I keep mm. struggling, I keep struggling, I keep struggling, I'm never good enough. And until we raise our perspective and saying, wait, my mind is saying my value and worth is tied to my father's approval. Now let me shift my perspective and see my value and worth is is self-determined. Mm -hmm. That's your third eye seeing that. Does that make yeah, sense? 100%. And that shifts our solar plexus then. Yeah. And what is really cool is that it also shifts our heart because now I love myself even after I lose the game, even after like it's then my love for self becomes less conditional. Mm -hmm. Which it, which is so liberating because then I, I then I can handle anything. And, my, and the love stays put. That's the anahata. The, the love that is unstruck and, and doesn't move. It's, it's, it stays no matter what's happening. Just like the mountain. It's staying put. It's embodied now. Doesn't matter if the wind of someone's criticism comes to, to wash against the mountain or it, to, try to try to push it over. It's like, no, I'm steady now. Yeah. I'm strong. Yeah. Which is exciting, I think. <laughs> that, I mean, that's that's what we're headed for, right? Like we're headed for that ability to be sovereign and non-dependent and have a 
have a fulfillment that's not contingent upon any criteria, which is inherently capricious and right. ephemeral. And so otherwise, we're just subjecting ourselves to the wind and saying, when the wind blows at 20 miles an hour from the west, then I'm happy. <laughs> and we're just out there all right. day waiting for that yeah. to happen. And sometimes it does. Yeah, and we're like, wee! wee! For a split, for a split second. second. But we have no control over it. So we're afraid of the long stretches when it won't. And the fear, actually, and then by the, when the wind is actually blowing and things are actually going, we're like, well, it's oh, going to stop gonna soon. Be. <laughs> yeah, it's going to stop yeah, yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't even enjoy yeah, that. Exactly. That's where the mind just, just, just fucks with us. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And what, is, what, what I love about that, what, what you just said, is that we can't control those things. And that's where the solar plexus, when it's out of a balance, becomes a control freak. Trying to control our partner, trying to control uh, our team, trying to control things that we, we inherently can't. And that's where our energy comes from more force. Because I'm out of control, or the, these experiences are out of control, but if yet, if my identity and my peace or my happiness, my value, my worth is attached to it, well then, you bet I'm gonna become a control freak. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna kind of control everybody else's choices, I'm gonna control my kids, I'm gonna control, I'm gonna to try to control um, uh, how people see me, and here comes all of the walls, here comes all of the masks, and then we start building these walls between who we truly are and, um, and who we want everybody else to see. And we're going to try to control everything, drive ourselves crazy, uh, to do that, to keep those things in place, which are impossible to maintain. Let me give everybody a secret. <laughs> okay, do it, do it. Here's the secret. Tune in, tune in. The here, secret here it is, is <laughs> the more you try to control, the less control you have. Right. Like all of this, all of this scramble for, oh, I need to control my relationship. I need to control every outcome. I need to control who she talks to. I need to control what happens. I need to control. Yeah, you're losing yeah, control. Yeah. Right. You're losing, I need to control what I need to control the bit. I need to th have people thumbprint in. I need to have all of this. I need to control my business. I need to micromanage everything. Right. You're going to fuck your business. Right. Up, you and know? you could just feel the anxiety in your voice when you're saying for sure. that. You could just like, it's just this. And. That's why, because it's linked to the nervous system trying to control things, and it really is a fight or flight response. Because when I can't control things, then then I'm in fear, I'm in survival mode, and then I, I'm going to force it. And you can see it's like these claws, and that's no surprise. That's the correlated to the adrenals, which is connected to the solar plexus, stomach problems, not breathing stress, anxiety, all of those nervous system disorders are right having to do with the solar plexus, trying to control everything it can. So no wonder adrenals are shot. And with your business, with Onnit, a big part I, I know of, of some of your most phenomenal products are dealing with adrenal stress because everybody's trying to control everything. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it's a, it's a non-winning battle. And then the adrenals are paying the price. Yeah. And so all my, of those... my adrenals are so in debt. Oh, for sure. <laughs> they've, they've, Me been too. Borrow, they've been borrowing. Ryan Giles knows about adrenals. They've <laughs> been borrowing for Everybody a while. Everybody yeah. listening and watching knows too, because mm. we're in a scramble, and it's likely connected, as it was to you, and 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 it, you know was for me, and and still unraveling that of where there's anxiety, where there's stress in environments I can't control, or where there's. Uh, post-traumatic stress from uh, an occurrence that took us by surprise knocked literally the wind out of us that's mm -hmm. all solar plexus stuff and we're where we're overcompensating to get approval and well let me work harder and I have so many clients I have thousands of clients over decades so many people are running that same story as an adult trying to get the, the approval of men, women, mother, father, somebody, and not getting it. And that level of unworthiness is, is a systemic uh, across our culture, for sure. Yeah, and, and your partner, you know, your romantic partner, that's a place where we tie so much for sure. to. You know, I mean, and that's, that's something that I've had to really realize, is like how much of having Whitney be the one who loves me the most made me feel like I was worthy of being right. loved, period. You know, like if she said, oh, well, I love you the most, then I could outsource my own self-love to her and say, well, 
this one, she's pretty awesome. She mm -hmm. loves me the most. Right. You Until know, which, you do something she doesn't like and, and then, then she doesn't and then, love yeah, you. Yeah. Or, or you <laughs> which just will feel happen that, in a minute. Yeah, you feel that <laughs> retraction go and then all of a sudden that pain you feel in a breakup is, oh, yeah, you know, there's some part of you that may miss the smells and the kisses and the time that you spend. But really, it's the deep pain, that heartbreak that people, right. that people talk about. Right. That's, the, that's because you've outsourced your right. own love. And so your love for yourself goes with the other person. Right. You, you think that, that that's my only source for love. Mm. And so if we, go, if we go even beyond how your partner is like, let's just go to relationship status. Because what happens if somebody's not in a relationship? Does that mean nobody loves me? You know, what happens if I just got divorced? Or what happens if somebody just broke up with me? Is it's like, now, am I unworthy of love? Am, am I not lovable? And those both go to the heart and to the solar plexus that says, if my identity, value, and worth was determined by me being in this marriage or me being in this partnership, and maybe for healthy reasons that our soul is evolving and our relationship is come to a natural completion and we split now am I unworthy is my because I'm having a relationship status of not together mm. you know so and and that'll be reinforced that'll be reinforced right. by auntie so-and-so who's like how come you're still single darling oh, right. you know, like why haven't you had kids yet right. you know like blah, blah blah all of these social norms which are really ways that you know people who've achieved something like the ego's in the ego only knows itself in relative position. Like, For sure. Period. Like that's the way it judges itself. It judges itself in relative position. So it will always find ways to skew a game to make sure that it's in, you know, one right. of the top percentiles, right? And that could be skin color, sex, right. gender, wealth. You know, relationship status, family, you name it. The ego will create the game in which you're at the top. Religion, sports team, doesn't doing fucking it matter. Right, what, right. Doing it right, whatever, whatever it is. The ego will create the game and then find a way to try and make itself above other people in relative position. You just got to understand that at that octave of thinking, everybody is scrambling to play that game. And then when they realize like, they don't have, you know, they'll find something. They'll find some like that natural desire to at least be better in something will then cause some people and quite a few people to want to kind of tear you down, to want to right. exaggerate that flaw or see or hypothesize some element of yourself so that they can maintain some level of superiority, which is what the ego desperately needs because the ego is, it's not connected to the truth of who we are, which needs nothing, which is connected to the mudra of creation, connected to source itself and right. knows that it's right. perfect already. Right. You know? And that, that's where the haters come from, is because if I don't feel control and if I feel alone and if I feel disconnected, well then I'm going to judge you and I'm going to use force or power or gossip to step on you to get ahead or to make you look worse so that I look better. I mean, this is basic junior high stuff. You know, this is like 100% 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old are like radical insecurities. It's like, well, then let me stab you in the, in the back. Let me gossip about you to step on you to get ahead. But it's also corporate America. Let me step on you to get the corner office. And I really don't feel bad about it. And the thing is about the solar plexus has integrity. The solar plexus has this need to really be in alignment and so when we're disrespecting others when we're stepping on other people to get to head at a core level we're stealing from the bank account of our own solar plexus mm -hmm. because our ethics sit in that solar plexus our ethics sit there and so the more we rob from our own bank account of our own truth here it comes is because I'm trying to get that power by stepping on you which is also an inauthentic way to get it bullying being the hater, being the critic, being the gossip, you know, those are all ways in which it is an indication that the self-esteem meter is down and they're not, you know, someone's not really coming from that place of self-respect. They're trying to get yeah. it from somebody else or command it from somebody else or that, take it. That which we judge in others, we judge in ourselves. Okay. Like that which we do to others, we do to ourselves. It's, a, it's, the mo it's like a hard thing to realize, but there's no way that you're gossiping about somebody else without gossiping about yourself because it's the same judgmental right. paradigm that you're stuck in. But that's one that I'm really, really understanding as, as we're trying to like, build our little community, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and create the really strong bonds. 
the thing that's probably the most detrimental and undermines the community the mm -hmm. most is when factions break off and talk amongst themselves and right. talk about other people amongst themselves or even not explain the situation, like keep insulated. That really creates, it festers, it festers right. problems. And, and I've been a participant. It's, well, we and all I've been participate. a participant in, the, in these problems oh, yeah. too. And I'm realizing like anything that I say about somebody I should also say to them, just as like a, just as like a rule, right? And and that's and that's like, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting thing because then it really makes you judge like, okay, what is the truth about what I feel, and am I willing to share that with that person? If not, maybe it's just a fleeting thought, and I can let it evaporate on its own. But having like like Don Miguel says in his four agreements, right. like impeccability with your word, huge. Because now we're now we're adding the throat chakra in there, but guess where the throat chakra sits? sits on top of the solar plexus, yeah. you know, and it sits on top of well, if I don't know who I am, well then my languaging is trying to get you to acknowledge who I want you to see me as, mm. and I want if you if you if I don't feel confident, I'm gonna want to tear somebody down to get ahead, and I think in that with the, when the gossip circles happen. It's like, look, if I have an issue with you, it doesn't, it doesn't address a third party. Yeah. But our out of integrity and our fear and our, and our lack of being in alignment is, well, I'm going to go over and talk to this person and talk about it because I don't actually have the balls to come to you and actually say what I actually need to say to you. Yeah. And um, because, oh, well, then you might reject me, you might get angry with me, and so I'm going to say nothing to you, but I'm going to say everything to this other person, um, which all it does is fester, because what also sits in the solar plexus is anger and resentment. That yeah. sits right in there in the liver that says, I'm just going to stuff my emotions and my feelings, and um, rage is then, and, and the extension of that is, is violence. And so we go, oh, why are people so violent? Why are, why are people so angry? Like, how could you harm another person when you're not really being an authentic with all of those emotions that are low down there and not being in integrity with your truth, well, then it gets stuffed like a volcano when it's going to come out and um, destroy somebody, either yourself or someone else. Where it also, it also gets challenging because I think there's, there's this kind of politeness, you know, social decorum, you know, kind of like, let's just pretend everything's okay, <laughs> step, separate wives style, like... <laughs> And oh, some... bless your heart! Yeah, I yeah, just, yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. I'm just like, what is husband? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I think that, you know, in romantic relationships, we have the permission in the zeitgeist to break up with somebody and say, like, look, this partnership isn't really serving me anymore. Right. And I think, but in friendship situations, it's like the the idea is basically yeah just kind of put up with it and ignore it and whatever and it'll go its own way but <laughs> but nonetheless those relationships can be as important or both damaging or beneficial right. as any of these romantic relationships it's like oh if the genitals aren't involved then you have no right, right for discretion anymore you just have to kind of deal with it or ignore it and i think that's a really unhealthy paradigm and dynamic yeah. as well and like those uncomfortable hard conversations you know, like instead of having them about the person to other people, just go straight to them. And that may be like, hey, I love you. I love you. And I'll support you forever. But our interaction and sharing time together isn't really serving me at this point for my highest good. But I wish you nothing but the best and right. good luck on your way. And, you know, if things change, we'll get in touch. That's all. That is discernment, which also sits in the solar plexus. Honesty and truth. Those are all things that sit in the solar plexus that when I'm honest that this relationship has served its purpose, you know, when I'm honest about that, then I can make the decision not to energize it as much. When I'm lying to myself, I'm now out of integrity with me and I'm out of integrity with you. Mm -hmm. And so many relationships, be it friendship, business partnerships, romantics, you know, relationships stay because I'm not being honest with the reality that this, is, this isn't a fit. Yeah. Maybe it was never a fit and I wasn't honest about that in the first place mm -hmm. and the solar plexus was just too wimpy to, to like... <laughs> Or too, or, gr or too greedy, or, or too manipulative. too insecure, like I'd rather have somebody than nobody, or we've been together for so long, and the thing is, like, those are not all authentic, because we're talking about authentic power and truth and integrity, those are not, 
you know, authentic reasons to stay with someone, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a business partnership, and that's where truth and integrity stands. And the, the guide that I really dig on this one is Archangel Michael, because he has that sword, not to behead somebody, but actually, in, in, you know, and this was one of my journeys in Peru, was, was that's what came through, is la espada de la verdad. Oh, this golden white sword of truth that helps, that is a tool for me to help discern. It sits right there in my solar plexus. What is true? What is not? What is mine? What is not? And what is a yes and what is a no? And, and, and that's for me to determine and I can't outsource that decision to, to you. It's got to be right here. The sword of truth. You've got it around your neck right there. It's like, that is the solar plexus in one of its most beautiful expressive ways is authentic power means that I want to be in integrity and honest. And, that, and if we're doing it in a loving way, then when we're evolving a friendship or a partnership uh, or a business relationship, we can do that consciously and, and kindly. Mm -hmm. Because ahimsa uh, also means with nonviolence because this is, so, this not, this is not a sort of violence. No. It's a sort of truth. And truth can sometimes be uncomfortable or painful, and yet it is powerful medicine when it's when it's spoken with kindness and compassion. Well, it can't be truth unless it's infused with love, right? right? Because right. then then the third eye isn't activated because you're not seeing right. from the right perspective. Right. You're seeing from right. your anger. You're seeing from the delusion. So you're never going to be speaking in truth if it's not coming out of right. love. But love doesn't mean it's a coddling, accepting everything, because that's not love for yourself. Yeah, because then now, now I'm now, bullshit. Now, now you're bullshit. bullshitting, and it's not <laughs> right. really true, right? So <laughs> if that's, the, really the, that's really the calling for that highest integrity, you know, and that is the, the symbol of the sword, the sword that separates truth from delusion. The sword, not only for, for you, but for everybody, to speak that loving truth. Which doesn't Always. mean I'm able to accept it if I'm not coming for, if my value and worth is determined by this relationship staying put and you're telling me it's over, well, I may not be able to see it from my third eye, I may not be able to see it from truth, I may see it from my wounded child and come to blame and anger and, and um, project and feel, blame you for hurting me. And then we get to come to truth and compassion and again say, I respect where you're at right now, mm -hmm. and it's still the truth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and wait, the truth is, I, uh, their response isn't about me, but m their response does warrant my compassion for where it hurts and sure. where they're coming at, interpreting it from a lower vibrational center of um, attachment and wounding and taking it personally when it really isn't. <laughs> Which is just like it's. It's really the classroom, and it's so delicate and so hard. No wonder we so often just run from that and avoid from those difficult conversations, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's the thing. That's the path. There's always, always right. different lessons and right. always different levels of impeccability that we can aspire to without self-judgment in the rear view, trying to stay stuck on something we did before, just acknowledge see become aware forgive immediately once you learn the lesson forgive there's no need for these the self-punishment of these past things that happened you did the best you knew how at the time and then now you can learn and you're from your perspective now you can get a better idea of that and then just move forward that's that that's that's the humility and accountability that says okay if i really did totally screw up a healthy solar plexus will say hey I'm sorry I lost my cool. I'm sorry I projected with you. Mm -hmm. um, and is willing and courageous enough to show up with honesty and also integrity that says, that was my fault. Yeah. Where the ego's like, it's you. you know, It's not my fault. It, you did it. It's your fault. <laughs> yeah. And when the solar plexus is in a healthy place, it's open and humble and willing to say, you know what, I, I did, I, I was doing this, or I, I did project, or I did blame you. And this is where healthy relationships really spiral upward instead of the opposite of going downward where the solar plexus is coming with accountability that says, hey, you know, and the ego isn't so entrenched in winning that it's, it's not able to say, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm working on it. And the, the, the willingness to, to be humble and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry. And yeah. And I think that's really helpful in relationships when the solar plexus stands down from all of its 
triggers and blame and and projections and and softens a little bit there's a there's a phrase that says win an argument and i was meditating on that phrase last night Ooh. and i was like wow that's actually never true. Right. It's actually something that we all say. That's a win-lose. That, that, lose, that lose. Right. You're putting the wrong framework. Win mm -hmm. an argument. Like, n no. There's you, a lot about that that doesn't match. That's like, win you can't, yeah. argument. Like, all right, you can have a disagreement, and the goal yeah. should be to come to greater clarity and yeah. understanding and expression of your truth. A resolution, even if that resolution is the termination of your friendship, relationship, whatever. But it's not a win. You don't win it. This is not a. It's not where you're trying to cast blame on either side and who's going to get the punishment, who's going to get the yeah. spoils. Someone's like, going to lose if someone's winning. Someone's going to exactly. lose. Exactly. And 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 the fact that you're even calling it an argument, right? rather than a discussion. Right. Win <laughs> an argument versus having a discussion. A discussion that has a resolution. And it's very funny because, you know, we have that idea. Win the argument is like, it's everywhere. And there's, 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 there's a difference between doing my best because we still want that part of our solar plexus to be achieving and thriving and meeting our fullest expression and our fullest potential and our fullest radiance, not at the expense of self and not at the expense of someone else. Mm -hmm. So that it's, I'm victorious, but it doesn't cost you anything. And I'm not victorious because I stepped on you yeah. or I hurt you in the process. And this is where on the planet and with humanity, we're so deeply hungering for that cooperative win-win where we all rise above instead of, okay, uh, big business wins and planet pays. Mm -hmm. Or I win and you lose. Or I win for the short term, but my health pays the price. And this is such a, a, a juicy and delicious place is when we are in the solar plexus, each of us in our authentic power, then we don't have to abuse ourselves or sedate ourselves or bully somebody else or um, create debris from winning or trying to fill our cup up when we're doing it ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so what advice would you have for people that are kind of struggling with with this dynamic because you've been through it and and I've been through it and we're still going through it because <laughs> the, the reality is you, you and I both are willing to say oh yeah yeah that is mine or I, I could do better there I think I think honestly the the biggest hindrance is the self-judge mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the big that's the thing that that's the thing that creates shame mm -hmm. and when the self-judge is there the, it's because the shame prevents you from looking at what actually is happening mm -hmm. And so the self-judge, when it's strong, when it's going to hit you hard with that hammer and create a lot of pain, self-inflicted pain, you'll create shame bubble around what mm -hmm. you do, which will prevent you from the awareness of seeing what you're actually doing. And then you won't be able to fix anything because you'll be shrouded blinded. and blinded by the shame. So how do you get rid of the shame? Well, you make sure that the self-judge you know, you remove his thorns and his barbed wire and his hammers and, and say like, no, I'm going to forgive myself no matter what. Like people think you need to be hard on yourself to keep yourself. It's the opposite right. because the harder you are on yourself, the more shame you're going to create, the slower you're going to go because the less awareness you're going to have. So like promise yourself that you're going to forgive yourself and that it's okay to just do your best and it's okay to be human and then feel the clouds of shame start to evaporate and then look at awareness as what's going on and just start to forgive all of that stuff instead nice. of meeting it with self-judgment just meet it with forgiveness and say okay great more things to learn more things to learn because i know some really conscious people you know and their self-judge is strong enough yeah. and their desire to be impeccable is strong enough and their their idea of themselves is at such a high level of impeccability that if it doesn't meet that they punish themselves right. severely and so what happens is they're so blind to what they're actually doing. And sometimes they're in right accord, but sometimes they're not. And when they're not, they can't fucking see it at all. Right. You know, so it's really the thing that's actually slowing them down for becoming that thing that they want to be. Right, that's, you, it, it kind of goes back full circle to what you just said, because it sounds like punishing when I don't uh, achieve goes back to like the dad thing, mm -hmm. or maybe it was mom or coach or whoever it was for you guys watching and listening, is that, <laughs> not good enough it goes back to the reason why anybody would do that is is if they were actually punished for 
you know, they, they, you learn the inner critic from someone. You learn the inner critic from society, a coach, a parent, that you're not good enough and you, you didn't do it, you know, an A is not an A plus. And or that just inner the, critic is just so hard and it sounds like that's still look, coming it's the, to it's what the, the Toltec have a word called the mitote, the marketplace, mm -hmm. right? We have social media now. <laughs> the mitote is everywhere. Yeah. Everything we do is being judged, mm -hmm. like and, and like literally by everybody. And even even what's even fucked up is like if you're someone's good friend, double tap that motherfucking photo every time. What are you gonna do? Be a be a little judge of their? Oh, you did good today. Right? You didn't do good here. What, I don't like that quote. You're gonna reinforce <laughs> that paradigm or not? No, just love them. Love them when they show up. You know what I mean? But we're all we're all co-participatory. In this kind of conditional reward punishment, you know, you get a gold star, you don't get a gold star. You get the heart, you don't get the heart. Right. You get the comment, you don't get right. the comment. Like, we're all a part of this, so it doesn't even fucking matter anymore about these. It does, of course, but like, it's ubiquitous. Right. So we have to do the self work. And this, I, I love that, you know, and he, hearing from somebody who I, I deeply respect and who is also very powerful and... Um, humble in the solar plexus to, for everybody listening and watching to hear, it's the softening. It's not more force here. Like you say being yeah. gentle with self. We're actually bringing in the more feminine side to the solar plexus that just accepts us where they are, where we are. Okay, so I was lost in addiction for a couple months. It's not like oh well, but it is like okay. Well, let me be gentle as I am healing. It's not going to be punishment. Guilt and shame are those lowest frequencies that we can possibly feel towards ourselves or project onto another. The lowest human emotions are guilt and shame. And there's something that we can control. Because I don't have to feel guilt. I don't have to take guilt. For, I don't have to take a guilt trip. I, I, I'm not interested in ever <laughs> eating from that buffet ever again. Yeah. And I also get to witness where my mind wants to take me to the guilt buffet. Uh, you should have done better. You should have done it faster. And so many people that are on this journey that says, oh, I should have seen that coming or I should have done it faster. I should have been better. It's like, well, that isn't accelerating. That doesn't, that doesn't inspire me to do better. It's like uh, my brother Ted Decker says, stop shitting on yourself. Yeah, exactly. So you're just shitting all over your, <laughs> right. shitting all over your life. You know? And so um, this has just been so delicious, Aubrey. Yeah. You, you and I can go for decades <laughs> of just weaving in and out of these beautiful like caves and caverns and beautiful channels of, of consciousness and truth and humility and um, insight. And I love, I love, love, love our relationship, our connection, and Likewise. how our souls really weave and dance in, in remaining curious about what do you have to teach me, brother, and what can I, what, you know, what can I learn, and um, where can I grow, as, as, and, and this is what this whole podcast is about, is how can we grow, how can we learn, how can we um, experience and share our journey authentically with others that are probably in that place where they're hiding and they don't really want to talk about these kinds of things. And you and I are just into this radical transparency. And I really appreciate that about you. And um, thank you so much for having me here um, in the Onnit headquarters. And uh, Onnit is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite companies <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, not just because it's your, 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 your brainchild and, and I remember a, a session nine years before it happened, a, a session we had together where you're like dreaming into this okay. idea, like, yes, go. And I could feel that fire inside of you, which also solar plexus of like being ignited and lit up about something and then being courageously going after that. So I want to acknowledge that you've done that, but the company is all about optimizing human potential and with products and with fitness and also with own the day one of my favorite ever books <laughs> and you. cold shower was this morning i had a cold I shower mean, this too. morning too, even it's cold i know it was cold today i was like yeah i could skip the funny it. thing like, is you finish and, and it's you so feel warmer you know yeah. so it actually yeah. somehow neutralizes the yeah. cold that's external yeah so own the day is a phenomenal book it's one of my favorites we'll make sure that it's in the show notes okay. links to everything and uh I'm so grateful for everything that you're doing, and you've got all the courses and everything that you're you're doing now. All kinds of good stuff. So good. Uh, check it out, and definitely follow the podcast because uh, 
we've dropped some amazing yeah, if you really? like this, definitely you can go back and, and check some of our episodes too, the Aubrey Marks Yes, we got like some, a couple, hun- almost, almost 100, 200. Hun- over 200. Oh my gosh, congratulations. Mm-hmm. Congratulations for being a beacon of light here, shining it bright. Just doing my best. Doing your best, and it's <laughs> awesome. And it's awesome. Thank you, love. Thanks, uh, for, thanks for your help along the way, and I'm so stoked for this podcast. It's going to be amazing for people to be able to drop in and be like this. Yeah, yeah, we've had a lot of amazing journeys and more to come. Yep. More to come. I'm taking to my mountain to my mountain. Let's do it. Okay. I'm ready. Cool. Use some mountain energy. Right? So uh, you can find me at shamangelichealing.com and we'll have all of that in the show notes and all of Aubrey's deets there. And this is this is about the journey for the soul and if you're still listening and, and watching right now, it's because there has been deep medicine here for you. And please do yourself, your loved ones, a favor. Share, like, download, subscribe, and give us some great reviews. Give us some feedback so that I can know how to deliver excellence to you over and over and over again. This is about authentic, real conversations and helping you step into your full optimal potential and shining your light in a way no one else can. So thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Aubrey. You're welcome. I'll be back. (laughs) Hey, I want to offer you listeners and fans uh, a special free gift for tuning into the podcast today. Uh, Because we talked about chakras, and, and we touched with so many different chakras during the episode, I would love to give you a free gift of my chakra balancing guided visualization, which is something that you can do in the morning or in the evening, and it walks you through all of the different chakra energy centers of the body for clearing and activation. You're going to love this. And I also want to give you uh, $100 off the Quantum Leap program, which is my signature online course that is all about 12 months of integration and implementing uh, high-performance strategies into your life. So. Uh, Check out the link. It will have the free gift offer so that you can download that and be balancing your chakras every day.